right from the beginning. We knew we wanted to go into the future. We didn't quite know how to do it. There was a lot of people who doubted that we could do the show. I was very excited with Dungeons and Dragons that they were going to the future. When I first read it, I thought there's no, there's no way. There's no way we can possibly film this. We had a very ambitious challenge to execute this show on a, on a television schedule and a television budget. The future episode was something that everyone was looking forward to. Dungeons and Dragons started as an idea that I had had before we even probably got the show picked up. And I remember going in and pitching it to people and thinking, oh, please don't say no, this is so much fun. But I was afraid everyone was gonna think it was too expensive. Josh asked me if he could do an episode which include flashes of the future. And I said, yes. And he said, you have rocked my world. So it became a, a real part of, you know, how we were developing the first season. And it evolved. The first version of it was a much more World War II type of storyline in tone. It was about Derek kind of getting a little group together. It was like the Great Escape. And they, you know, they stormed the wire and they got out. And uh, it was big. And up to a point, we were going to do that episode. And, and it just, at the last minute... It just was too expensive, frankly. And it's one of those horrible things where you kind of, they'd done such a great job, and I remember I called them in my office, and I just said, guys, we just can't do it. You know, we're just going to have to really radically change the episode, and we have to radically change the episode today so we can hand it in tomorrow. And we sat around for a couple hours, and, so I, and I, had, I had a concept for this house, this sort of house where, you know, they do psychological torture, and I thought, well, that would be smaller. And, you know, we would do this sort of almost weird haunted house kind of thing, and it was more mysterious and more psychological and that's what we shot you know but it was a very you know radical change we sort of felt that we couldn't spend the entire time in the future it was just not going to be producible so we wanted to have a story that took place in the present day and the future and that's kind of how the, the Derek story came about. I was really happy when Josh came up with the idea of having Derek as a character, providing a brother for Kyle. We had had lots of conversations about bringing Kyle back <laughs> himself. And I told Josh that I thought that it would just make people's heads explode. Kyle Reese was really, truly a loved character. So carrying that name through the series now and being the only Reese that's really left, a lot of responsibility comes with that. I think that the character has been a really smart and cool addition, uh, a different perspective to the dynamic. Metal! It's all around a dream for anyone. They, they give me the best emotional stuff to work with. I have such a great character as far as development and backstory, uh, and it's kind of endless stuff. I can always draw from new things and create new things if I need them. And then I get to kick ass. I get to fight Terminators. In terms of Dungeons and Dragons, there was really no part of the process that wasn't fun and exciting, but also incredibly difficult. So what we did is do a tremendous amount of preparation. We decided to shoot this episode last, even though it airs earlier as episode number six. That was in order to give us as much preparation time as we could get and to spread our money as far as it could go. You need time, especially with something this ambitious, because we had to build the world, we had to build these destroyed cities, we had to build the HKs, we had to build the jet engine, we had to build the chronoportation rooms. You see very, very briefly at the end of the show, you know, one of the great things about Jim Cameron is, you know, he didn't have a lot of money when he shot the first movie, and, and the aesthetic that he set up for the future apocalypse, kind of future war scenes, was very low-tech and, 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 and doable. I mean, I think it, I was always excited that we could recreate what he did. Fortunately, a brilliant location scout found this beautiful uh, location in downtown Los Angeles. It's not big, but it's exactly what we needed. The bones were right. And what I mean by bones is it, it was... <laughs> It was rubble pile with rebar sticking out of it. It was concrete rubble pile. Mike Novotny brought in cars and all kinds of stuff, the, the residue of, of our society that he could design the set to. So as much as possible at ground level was real. It's when you got above this rubble pile that it became 
it said extension became a visual effects shop. They're explaining to me that, oh yeah, everything past, everything past the concrete, the sky, the buildings, all that stuff, it'll all be gone. In CG, we made 3D models of rubble piles and twisted metal and rebarb and pieces of buildings and added that. And then beyond that, more rubble and beyond that, freeways and beyond that, you know, what's left over of a Starbucks and a McDonald's, on and on and on and on. In the chronoportation room, which you see very briefly at the end of Dungeons and Dragons, it was like, how does that thing work? The technology is time travel. And the jet engines that you see in that room are generators for a tremendous amount of electricity. And so the chronosphere technology is, is, pretty, is pretty cool. It starts off with a singularity. It starts off with one atom, and it pushes itself outward. It's burning 2008 away, and it's replacing it with air and volume from 2027. It's the way to get you safely into another time zone. It's the only time I've been happy to be with three other men naked is like, you know, I'm, I'm traveling through time in the in Terminator, you know? I don't care, naked, whatever, let's do it. HK design is completely new and I think really scary. It looks like a shark. I upgraded it and refined uh, much like I did with the Triple Eight and just gave it a little bit more logic and a little bit more badassness to it. And then also gave it its own kind of style. You have to watch it frame by frame, but in Dungeons and Dragons, the vertical stabilizers and the engines are, are rotating and moving. The thing is, is alive. You know, when we were doing the, the battle with the HKs, Jim was on set, so he was talking about what he had planned as far as what they were thinking, and okay, you've got the gun, and you know, I think it's gonna kind of swoop down this way, and possibly, and we were just kind of throwing ideas. The whole sequence was set up based on, on a kind of a motion path where Derek was gonna run to that would allow him to be safe, but also give us the wide enough scope HK! to be able to, to show you destroyed Los Angeles, HK's flying over, and explosions happening. It all had to be timed just, just right. My job is to get with Joel, where should we put these explosions? And then push the trigger at the right moment. And my concentration is only on the actor and his spot. He hits this mark, boom. Another actor, boom. Another actor, boom. And we watch it closely. And when all that works, it works well. Boom, there'll be an explosion and run out. Okay, cool. Steve's really great at designing effects. I wanted him to make it a certain altitude, a certain size, a certain volume, and a certain luminance so I could fly an HK through the explosion. It makes the visual effects look real because you're actually seeing something that you've seen before. You've seen vehicles drive through fire. I think my favorite scene is where the Terminator comes down the hall with the, with the machine gun and is mowing people down and then we have the Terminator tripped up and smashed through a wall and some are shooting him with an RPG. I loved the grenade gun I got to use. That was, that was a really fun night. When you have explosives and squibs going off in there, you've got to make sure that you have the area so it's not so confined. If you're doing an explosion in a confined area, that flame has to go somewhere. And if it can't go up, it's gonna go out. And that's what was logistically tough. That was the first episode. We had a real endoskeleton. In episodes before it, we've had the endoskeleton, but it's been a special effect. Rob Hall has probably lost more sleep during the past production season than anyone building a practical Terminator endoskeleton. I think that when he volunteered to do this, he didn't realize how time-consuming and arduous it would be but he did a fantastic job. And when you see that endoskeleton in the fire pit, it is just fantastic. I mean, you see all this goop and mess on it, you know, that just ups the level of realism. I had to, to break down and actually take off the skin and it was, it was really, it was a long day, but it was cool. I really like that scene. I like that scene with Dean. That's one of my favorites, favorite scenes probably. I am blown away by what we were able to accomplish with this show. If we all didn't work together brilliantly, it would be a disaster. I, to, to this day, haven't seen anything on episodic television that looks like that. It really genuinely blew my mind. I feel like it looks really good. I feel like it looks like the future apocalypse. I, don't, I feel like there's a lot of people who hold those scenes very dear to their heart, a lot of fans, and I think they came away saying, yeah, those, those felt like they could have been Jim Cameron scenes, or those, those felt like they could have been in the movies. 